you're now watching Two Old Farts Making Noises. Welcome to Canadian Art Today. With your host, Paul Constable. Oh, wait, we don't have the candy canes anymore. Oh. No, well, they, weren't, they weren't candy canes, as we discussed last time, but they were actually straws, I think, or I don't know what you, right. what they, what you people in North America call them, but they were, they were a paper straw. Straws, we call them straws. We're not like, you know, some, we don't come from a different planet. I mean, you know. Well, yeah, so it sometimes feels like that, Stephen, but there you go. I know, that's true. Were they, were they paper straws or plastic straws, right? Yeah, paper. Oh, I'll well, well, definitely, definitely 100% paper, I, you know, because it, Paul, would we would we start a show with plastic straws with you on it? I ask myself. I hope, well, they last forever. We know that. So I'm here forever. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. You will be. This is. This this show is now going to live in infamy, and when you go, your children's great 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 grandchildren are going to be that yeah. was your great 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 grandfather with these uh, idiots. Don't you don't you, <laughs> don't, you, don't, you, don't you remember the old photo booths you used to be able to have that would go in and take photos, the black and yeah. white photos? Yeah, yeah. And for twenty, you used to have either had cigarettes to put in your nose or straws, right? <laughs> yep, yep. And it was cool because they used to be a quarter. And I went to a party about a couple months ago, and they have the old photo booth, and you can oh. do black or white or color, and it's free. But like I've seen them at like arcades now, and they're like five to ten dollars. And I'm like, you know, I had a phone, I'm good. But I remember we used to have the Polaroid where you would pull the film out, yeah. and do all that kind of cool stuff. Now everybody's film the cloud; it's instantaneous. It was more fun because you had to go get it developed, and you kind of waited for the excitement. Now it's like click. Like I have a friend; I'll go to dinner with her in LA. She will take pictures of her food so last time we were all at dinner i took pictures of her taking pictures of her food and she goes you're not going to post that are you i go of course i am because if you're dumb enough to take a picture of a plate of whatever then people don't have to take a picture of you taking food so go figure now we used to try to get as many people as we could into that booth you know yep well, that was very cool. the, dollar. the quarter had to go be split within about eight people right yep and, and not only that <laughs> the, the kids don't remember but it, it had the carton so it wasn't like a, um, a phone booth where you close the door and nobody knows what a phone booth is. But anyway, the phone, so it was the curtain. So you had to get everybody in with the curtain. And once you dropped the quarter, you had that 30 seconds to get everything set up. Yeah. 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 Those are yeah right. I was reading, reading the other day, actually, the cameras are coming. A lot of, uh, uh, you know, the, the Gen Zs are going back to old-fashioned cameras because they think it's yeah. like it's cool. They've just discovered yeah. them again. So. Just like the vinyl, yeah. vinyl is yep. back. Just, like, oh. just like the vinyl, yeah, yeah. Never yeah. got off no, of vinyl. Of vinyl to me is well, something I love. Vinyl. Yeah. Now we're all stuck, all stuck in in this uh, digital concrete. So there's no way we can get out yeah. of this. So. Uh, That's a but so you've good. got you you've got another guest today, uh, Paul. I think. Uh, we have an awesome guest. I mean, I always say that every week. I say we've got an awesome guest, but we have. You uh, do. We have a very, very, very good watercolors. Um, Darcy Polney, and uh, we're, we're, we're going to bring him in here. We are. Let's bring yeah, Mr. Darcy. I'll, I'll give him a little bit of a, a plug here, and then we'll okay. uh, we'll go on. Then we'll bring him in. We'll bring him in. So uh, Darcy, you know, he does uh, amazing watercolors. They're still life watercolors, but they're more than a still life watercolor. I mean, we're going to talk about the subject matter that he paints. You'll see it in one fashion, but once he starts talking about it, you really understand that he's going, it's a very deep, a very deep series of paintings. So he's a uh, Alberta College of Art uh, graduate from the mid seventies, actually he was in my class. So I have really a great fortune to be able to talk with him. I haven't talked to him for years. And uh, his work is very narrative. So uh, I, I don't wanna to get too much. He's from Camrose, Alberta. And uh, let's just bring Darcy in here. Let's speak to him. And there he is, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. There he is. There he is. There he is. Hello, everyone. Hi, Darcy. Welcome. Welcome. We're thrilled to have Welcome you on the show. I'm uh, excited that now we're, you know, what we're going to see. And Paul's uh, uh, with such an introduction for you. So. Yes, yes, yes. I hope I can excite you as much as he did. Can, can, you, get, <laughs> can you get a little closer to the mic there uh, or turn your volume up a little bit? 
There you go. Yes, move closer if you yeah. can. Just a, yeah. just, a, just a smidge, as they say. So a smidge, yeah. 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 We don't want you as big as you'd be like a bobblehead big. That don't, we don't need that. <laughs> yeah. I'll try to keep my head in one place. There you go. Or if you decide <laughs> to move it, it's okay. We, we still like it. Yeah, to so. me, I can't, yeah. I can't move around because I kind of I kind of break up when I move around. I yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was up my messy studio in my office. Well, it's uh, no, it's great, Darcy, to be able to connect here. It's uh, uh it's, it's a great format, and we uh, would love to have a conversation here in the next little while with you about uh, about your art and uh, and what you're doing here. So let's just uh, rock and roll, as we say. Uh, yeah. so we we'll just talk a little bit about I think we talk first a little bit and then we'll show an image because um. Uh, I think we're going to need some of those images to really um, show what's what's happening with what we're doing. So, um, so initially, we we actually we studied together. I think uh, in college. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we sort of had that commercial background, um, and I find with that comes discipline. I think a lot a lot of people kind of poo bah the the graphic design world a little bit in the fine art world, but when you realize that when you, you set a graphic designer um, <laughs> afoot, I guess, after he finishes his career, he still has that, uh, I guess I'll, I'll call it that will to keep working nine to five-ish a little bit. You've got a schedule and you get up in the morning and you do your thing, get your work done, and you can produce an awful lot of great work. You've got a skill set that you've worked at for years. So, and I can see that in your work. Uh, it's amazing uh painting darcy this really truly amazing painting that uh, it's come thank you very much uh, yeah. yeah i find that uh, the advertising uh restricted the way my growth uh you know you had to make a living so that, that's what i did but uh it it made me go in different directions over the years like at one point i was painting like norman rockwell kind of things because that's what everybody was doing in the 60s 70s and 80s right then I, I went in more into uh, Western style. And then I started doing pastels, but they were more of a um, group of seven flavor. Everybody was seeing a group of seven kind of a texture to them. Then when I moved into the watercolor, I got extremely sick from uh, working with uh, oils and uh, adding additives to it to make them dry quicker. And I got really sick for about a year. So I switched to acrylics and then pastels and now I'm in the watercolors. But with the watercolors, it has allowed me to become the artist I always wanted to be. I, I started painting things that I wanted to paint rather than for galleries or clients or uh, you know what people might think is art. I just wanted to paint things that represent me and the things that I do. Yeah. I, I can see that I can I can see that in your work because well the series of work that we're gonna look at today is uh, they're mostly still lifes. Um the still life format. They're large as well, are they not? They're fairly I, I'm only getting context from the images that you sent us, but yeah uh, the, so I've done some if you look at the image behind me there's a crane above that that's about fifty inches tall. The the watercolor that's behind the little painting in the front there. Some of them are 45 inches, some are 50, some are... Well, that's uh, big, yeah. Yeah, so they're quite large. I like to get the uh, the detail in there, and that's probably the uh, discipline, like you say, from the graphic design. Uh, I, I try to be looser, and uh, that's what the pastels allowed. But when I went to the watercolor, it gave me a certain amount of freedom to be more creative and yet still retain the detail that I like to put in my work. Yeah, there, 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 there is a lot of detail in there. It's not quite like a Prashankale egg or something, but it's sort of like... Uh, <laughs> just, <laughs> yeah. yeah, sometimes I put too many things in. Uh, uh, you know, I set up... And, and the hunt to me is almost as important as doing the, the artwork. I'll just show you a couple of pieces here. Um, well, yeah. Oh, there yeah. We go. It's yeah, we'll see how these figurines all fit into the works. Yes, nice to see the three-dimensional what you're going to be using. Yeah, okay, that's, that's one of them. The, 
Now, is that like a ballerina or is that a? It's actually a jester. A gesture. Okay. I can, it's a I mean, smaller... it. It was called... yeah. yeah. That's very cool. Yeah. And, and I've collected, you know, a lot of different things that I've worked into. You can see the one in behind my shoulder there is this piece here. Like I'm right. finding the uh, camera. Yeah. But uh, I just like the translucence and things that happen in a lot of these pieces. And, and that's what drew me to this style that I'm working in. Uh, people discard all of this uh, objects. I find them in different uh, antique stores and... Uh, yeah, they just draw me, drew me in, and my wife and I have been collecting them for years. And when I started painting, I realized that I should paint the things that I love, and that's what I loved was all these things we had. Yeah. Uh, well, so, and I can see that in the works. And um, you know, maybe maybe we should actually pop the first image up. I mean, just get one image up on the screen here, and we can uh, we can yatter about it. There we go. There's the one that you're talking about. That you showed us that vase or one similar to it. Okay, I can. I got a little thing here. Just let me step out of the screen for a second. I have them here somewhere. Add them. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry about that. But this is the this is the vase here. It's actually quite large. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I fell in love with that. We had it on our table for a long time, and I saw the light coming through it and how everything just crystallized on, onto the tablecloth. So uh, Very prismatic. They become very prismatic in, with the light. Oh, going through. Yeah. Just, yeah the, the glass work and the imagery that happens in a, in a piece of glass, especially when you put it onto... Uh, different fabrics like I've been using in, in the backgrounds. It just uh, enhances the entire. Yeah. No, we can see that definitely can see the detail uh, what's happening there. Um, so what happens with these? OK, so this one is minimalized. There's only a cup in there and uh, maybe a little perfume bottle or something in the foreground. Yeah. And, and uh, this piece of glass in there. So we've got man-made objects sitting in there with uh, florals that are kind of starting to show up in the background and underneath and some drapery. Um, yeah, I, I wanted to take these objects that people cast away and release them back into nature in some way. So uh, I've introduced live uh, natural uh, objects with these uh, antiques and things and, and the drapery and everything to help uh, give them new life and let people see things in a, in a new light, the things that were discarded. They, uh, my, my show was, uh, there is still life. It's not, they're not still life. There is still life in these objects. And I want people to see that you can have all this life and, and just rearrange it in your home in some way. Just to, right. You know, so. No, I like the, well, we'll get into some of the other, the, the, this context of man-made objects and natural items, like yeah. floral things that are here, right? Right. So, it started slowly with this one first, I think, where I started adding more things, and then it became bigger in, as, a, as I progressed in over 25 paintings. So, yeah. so is this like a full sheet of watercolor, this one? Yeah, that would be about... Uh, 27 by 30, I think. Yeah, be a full sheet. So having done watercolor, I know it, it's uh, it's sort of like putting multiple portraits on the same page and no screwing up, right? It's just like oh, yeah. so you, you, well, you, you keep adding things to a page and it, you, it not only gets complicated, but it also, um, the, the danger element increases if, I guess if you if you look at it that way, you know, smudging and your hand drags over a page, and you got to be careful that's dry or wet when you move into certain areas with a watercolor. How do you how do you, how do you work with that when you like it's a large piece of paper, highly detailed? Is it a cold press or a, or hot press paper? This is a cold press. I like a bit more texture to the surface. The cold press is a little too smooth for. What I try to do with the bleeding of the color and, and the watercolors. Yeah, and they will leave a hard edge on you too sometimes. After yeah, 
Well, you get a hard edge on this too, but uh, it, it just gave me some freedom to do the bleeding a little bit differently than a cold press does. Right. Uh, but uh, I have done where all of a sudden I'll be working and I had touched a, a wet spot and I put my hand on the, on the paper and all of a sudden there's a blob somewhere. <laughs> so I will just paint a flower over it or something to try to cover it up and integrate it into the painting. I don't remember which ones that I, that's happened to, but uh, I have I have covered them up quite well. Yeah, no, I think it's uh, it, I think that comes with skill. Uh, the skill yeah, well, set. You learn how to uh, you learn how to fix up the screw ups, I guess. Well, I think you go with the flow, right? I think a lot of this stuff is um, you can get all worried about things a little bit, but having a watercolor experience is understanding how you can turn a disaster potentially into a huge advantage. Yeah, I think yeah. that sometimes becomes the magic in a piece of work. Um, and you know, yeah. sometimes it becomes the best piece of the work uh, at times if it becomes, you know, yeah. if it's dramatic enough that you need to play it up. So it becomes the focus. Yeah. So, and Andrew Wyeth was doing a painting of a, a cow by a gate and he had dropped his brush on the cow and it splattered all. <laughs> it like it had got mud all over it. He just left it because he said that looked better than the original. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Those, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Accidents are, are in it integral part of painting i think yeah well so here we go we got uh one of these uh, i guess is a ballerina or a dancer oh yes in this one oh, here. dancer yeah dancer so i i like the flow you know the backgrounds that are happening the flow of the background and and your figurine so they're they're kind of integrated with you know the pieces it's sort of like um, is that a little swan thing holding the rose or something in the one corner? Yeah, there's a swan there so, in the background. I've painted a swan around her to try to uh, show the, I guess, the swan lake or, or whatever, the dance. Uh, okay. Yeah, so we, you have to give us some of the background on some of the pieces because we don't, as I don't have titles or anything that we're working with on these. This oh, one I kind of like because of the neck is, the neck is S-shaped and it's soft and it's rolling and you can see those things forms picking up in some of the other objects and in the dancer. So they, they are relating to each other and that, uh, you know, it's picking up the colors as well. Like in yeah, that, in those yeah. silvers, yep. right? Yeah. yeah. With, with the live rose and then the rose on the, uh, on the little vase. Uh, so it, it, it's, it's showing the inanimate object created by man to bring nature into our homes. And then, there's the actual piece of nature in that one. Uh, so that's, uh, I guess, the integration in this one. It's probably a little more subtle than some of the others. Yeah. But with the uh, swan that I've got in the background behind her head, that I tried to create that, bring life back in from this glass swan that's at the bottom right. So, so do you set up a still life and then take a photo of it or photos of it? Oh yeah, absolutely. And you do your lighting and yeah, lights. when lights are on, my wife uh, Lee uh, helps me quite a bit. She'll come running and she'll say, "No, that's not the right, right scarf or, <laughs> or whatever in the background," and she'll put something else and it'll work. Like this one here you're showing right now, she helped me set that up and bring some of her, her scarves and some of the things that we bought because I knew I was going to be doing this kind of painting, so I end up buying things as we go to Canmore, or Victoria, or wherever. And, uh, yeah, this this one's a very very nice rich painting, and I think it's just the those rich colors. It almost has a um, I guess a little European feel to it as well. Like there's this old world feel to it. The, yeah, this one seems to be quite popular. It, it's uh, it's called fragile, and I was trying to show the how fragile nature is, and. Uh, all the all the objects like the swan and the flower encapsulated in the glass teapot, uh, the black and red splashing uh, fabric beside the salmon is indicative of uh, the oil going to the east coast and the fact that people are uh, concerned about transporting oil through the salmon fishery area. So it's all about the environment. Almost uh, the center part is supposed to feel like a, a waterfall, that kind of thing. So yeah, 
So that's yeah, the salmon is sort of hidden in between the folds, jumping out. But I really like these little orange pieces that are spawning out from there, right? They're, they're jumping out. It's almost like it wants to swim upstream or it wants to do its thing. But um, I'm, I'm very much concerned about the environmental aspects of things. And I like seeing artists making responses to nature and the struggle it's having with how we see beauty and how nature sees beauty. We've already got a Garden of Eden and we're screwing it up, right? And oh, absolutely, yeah. It's sad. Well, yeah. I, I have to be one of the people that I think that's probably uh, all my life I've had cars and I've had quads and everything. So yeah, the environment is an issue for sure. Yeah, so I like, and I like pieces that, but your, your work is, it's there but it's not in your face there. So someone could quite nicely put this in their living room and go about their business and they're not really agitative about uh, the concerns of the environment because they can see all these lush colors and things. So I, I, I guess I bring it in like, it's sort of like a great um, music, piece of music that has a context of say a war as a background and it's an incredible riff. You love the song until you read the words, right? Yeah, yeah. And I and I sense this with yours. Yours is a great song, but there's a lot of great words that are written there that aren't they aren't visible until you really start looking at what the what the content is. So I and it takes I would take you take you days and days to sit and just really appreciate the piece of work. Can you kind of talk about that? The layering of some of the content that's in this one, for instance, you mentioned the salmon and the water, but um, yeah, the uh, I guess that's really I want people to uh, to look at the work and see what they want to see. But this is what I, as I built it, I mean, it was almost accidental yeah. that this went the direction that it went. Uh, I put the salmon in at the last minute, thinking this really does look like a waterfall, all of that. So. Yeah, some of that I can see in some of the other works. It's almost like it, uh, and I won't, and I'm not going to make, like, I shouldn't make suggestions or anything, but I think it's just, it works the way it is. But sometimes the salmon is almost like one of your artifacts that you've got sitting on top of the table. And it, the way it's put in, it's kind of cool because I see that in some of your other works there, like the birds are almost like they're little bird shapes that are put in the foreground and things. So you, you're bringing nature in, in, in actually, in, in not much in this one. This one's more in the foreground, but subtly. Some of yeah. the other ones, you bring your nature, pull it in in the background. So they're like two different worlds, and you're marrying them together. And uh, yeah, I like seeing that. Uh, but this is a very lush, rich thing. The scarves and that, the detail is amazing on it, uh, Darcy. But trying to, and when it gets this way, it can get pretty complicated, you know, especially for the viewer. You know, the, you know, trying to understand uh, the complexity of the of the painting and why. Yeah, I guess they ask why, what, why, and what are you doing? What are you trying to say? So yeah. you've explained that, though. It's it's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. We could maybe bring another. Yeah, there we go. Okay, this uh, this piece kind of touches on a couple of subjects. It's almost like a mother and daughter consoling each other maybe during the Me Too movement or uh, meeting a daughter again or losing a daughter and all the controversy that's and feelings that are involved in that relationship. So you've got the drapery in behind the pane of glass and then drapery in the front of the pane of glass, almost to show the, the pain and the healing all at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, you can see the faces with the, the the little porcelain piece on the left, the large head, and there's that figurine that's in in that vase. They're kind of looking at each other. I can see that. Yes, this is a a vase that I purchased from a a lady in, uh, in on Vancouver Island, and I asked her permission to use the painting, the the piece of pottery in my painting, and she said uh, she was fine with me using it. Uh, she's a, <clears throat> ended up with arthritis and wasn't able to throw ceramics anymore, but I really loved her work and uh, 
I was blessed to have her permission to put this in my painting. Yeah, yeah and I, you know what? There's some, a lot of psychological things in here where you just, I didn't understand the story until you just mentioned it about, um, but you see the swan with the head bowed down. Yeah, that's almost like society trying to make uh, amends for how people are treated or, or the yeah. mother and daughter are, you know, it's, it's a healing image, I, I thought. It's a, it's a it's a nice vehicle to uh, transfer that messaging. I just I I didn't you know I sense this the sorrow in that head. Oh um, good. Yeah. yeah. So I, but I didn't know the story about the two figures. So and about the me too or the mothers and that and the daughters. So it's just like uh, yeah. See, the me too isn't my subject to present. So no. Uh, no. Uh, but but uh, that was the feeling that I got from it. That but. Is that a windowsill across the horizontally across the foreground and behind? Yeah, so it's a big window that was in behind, and there's a pane of glass in there. So there oh, is okay. some reflections of the subjects yeah. in the glass. Yeah, I, I like that, and I, I psychologically, it's just it's a bar it's a barrier, right? There's two worlds, and it's separating the two. Were nicely designed piece, and again, there's a lot of. Uh, I think as an artist, we, we put a lot of stuff in our work that a lot of times it's not spoken about. Yeah, when I, when I was a kid, we had storm windows like that in our house. And yeah. uh, my father, my stepfather, when he'd come home uh, and finally fall asleep, I would escape through these windows in, <laughs> at night. So uh, I, I painted them in a couple of times because it just uh, was my way of escaping reality. So. Tom Sawyer, a little bit of Tom Sawyer in you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is a, yeah, this the, one's really quite different than the other ones. This one's an aerial. You're looking down on it. Yeah, yeah. Quite yeah. a bit, and I'm trying to, because of them, this is probably the most different of them. Because it's because of the design element. Thing. Can, you, can you talk about that a little bit, about what you're doing yeah. and thinking here? This is called a nest of roses, and of course, with the glass bird. Again, it's a, there's two uh, perfume uh, bottles uh, that I collected. That the bird one, and uh, oh yeah, I see the bird now. Yep, yeah, right there. And the that's the tablecloth that we actually have with this uh, artichoke in it. And uh, <clears throat> again, we're bringing nature into our homes with these inanimate objects. So. Uh, it really accented when I put the, the the nest of roses on this subject. That was the only way I could uh, capture the feeling of this piece by coming down on from the top. Right. Uh, <clears throat> but that's uh, yeah. I just loved all the texture and all of the movement that happened, even in the uh, corner of the. Uh, tablecloth it, it had a lot of small texture and it just helped integrate it into the uh the live the live part that would drive me crazy i'm sitting like working with a spirograph almost like not trying to paint all that i'm a messy painter i don't i don't i don't paint yeah, i like the way you paint because you get, you're doing it freely uh, yeah this is a bit controlled that's for sure yeah well you you need all those years of experience that you've done uh to do this kind of stuff yeah, you know, to handle a large watercolor is not the easiest thing to do, and it takes years. Like people that have never done this are just a lot of artists who just say, "I'm just going to be an abstract painter," and it takes a while till they realize it, it ends pretty quickly unless they've done some other um, studying, either drawing or doing other things. But to do a watercolor and just even simply gradate a page from a medium darkness down to a light darkness, a whole sheet without a watermark without a, a blossom happening on you without a dry spot you've got a skill set that you can you can use for everything after that um, yeah and once you learn that then you if you look at this one closely there is brush strokes as i as i went in because it's a textured uh the dry brush kind of a form yeah, dry brush in there because it was a fabric uh yeah. table so I wanted to get some of that flavor in there, but uh. no, you're all you're always looking at ways of reproducing textures and 
represent what you're doing and uh, it's a nice representation that's happening here i think i love um, well, this one is a, a bit of a, uh, a step away from the bringing in the inanimate objects uh, i've gone almost completely to nature on the on the last two i think that i did i did these uh sweet peas uh i just loved the texture and movement that was created in in the painting and the, the drops of water on them and uh yeah, the color transitions from top to bottom. It, it, yeah, it's it organized chaos. Exactly. Yeah, it yeah. does the same thing to me that some of the uh, objects that I collected, it just uh, enlightened me. Uh, uh, everybody that looks at this says, oh, my grandmother used to grow <laughs> these. And so, it, yeah, I really like the organized chaos is a good way to say that for sure. Yeah. No, it's like the, yeah, it, you know, sometimes it can feel very flat, but this one, this one has got, a, there's a lot of depth that's happening in between all those folds and when you start painting, undercutting and, and painting layers going back. Um, because when you look at sweet peas, it's hard to see through them to the back edge. Like they're, they're, they're a mat. They're really a mat of uh, vines and foliage. Absolutely, absolutely. I had to uh, uh, modify it quite a bit from what the photo that I had took to create that depth in there because there was a lot of, like you say, a mat. It, it just became too much. So I just. This, this, is, yeah, this is probably your most abstract of the pieces. Um, when I squint at this and kind of look at it, though, you know, there's there's a really nice abstract thing setting up in this in this piece of work. Uh, the reds and the purples and then the greens that are pulled in behind it. So the, it's sort of, uh, it, it's, it's tough to, I guess, uh, how do I put it, block color and shape when you're designing a piece like this because it can just look like wallpaper. Yeah. Know, you know, so right. you, you have to have, again, uh, the sense that there is a focal point somewhere in the work and there's, like your eye has to follow those vines, you know, to get you the story as to what's happening. So, so what made you just produce this piece and not make it into a still life of some kind? Uh, I'm not sure. I just, uh, I was doing so much of the setting up and doing photography to try to set things up that I uh, found a photo that I had of these sweet peas and then I composed a, uh, from that, I just like the direction of the way the red just swooped to the right of the painting. And uh, yeah, it, it just had all the movement that it, it just drew me in. And I kind of like the direction that I went in this one. Yeah, no, that's good. I like this. No, I like it. And it's your, you're right. So sometimes when you paint so much of one type of subject matter, you need a bit of a break. Yeah. Um, from this. And, and, and artwork does evolve. Like you, know, you can see in this one that you've got up there now, uh, I integrated even more wildlife with the uh, inanimate objects with the, the frog on the uh, teapot and the, the perfume bottle with the uh, lily top on it. So when I set those up, I thought the perfect thing would be a, a photo that I took on Vancouver Island of a crane in the water, a blue heron, I mean. And uh, yeah, it just worked because of, uh, you know, the the glass uh, snail and everything. It just it just seemed to really work with the nature. Uh, uh, yeah. Nature is definitely stronger in this one. Uh, yeah. Definitely uh, where it's become the dominant and uh, the artifacts are supplementary to it. If it's complementing yeah. And I've got a couple like that where, where the nature has really taken over from the inanimate objects where they're right. just a subtle interjection into the paintings. Right. This one kind of, you know, and, and not in a drug thing, man, this one has kind of a um, a store, a real story to it, like children's storybook almost. It, it feels, it feels Beatrix pottery a little bit. It feels that, and it's not bad. It's just saying it's, um, because the context is the little frog and the, uh, you know, the language of, 
of the pots and the teapot and the things like that. I guess it's relative to what you read as a kid um, as to what you get from it. But I, I still like it. It's a nice light. It's not a heavy painting. It's a nice light-hearted painting. And uh, yeah, I agree with you with the. Uh, I mean, the way the frog is looking like it's going to get eaten any second. So it's got some. <laughs> yeah, it is very whimsical. Actually. I forgot about that. He's the food. I forgot completely. Like, yeah, yeah. He's got his eye on the food. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Always the food chain thing going on. You know. Yeah. So that I, that's what I liked about it was the. Uh, it gave life to that lid on that teapot. Like it, it was aware that this uh, blue heron was there, so that's <clears throat> I like this. One. Yeah, and this is this is right. When you speak about it, I, I'm just thinking like the image is quite small that I'm looking at on my screen, but mm -hmm. it's still there. And you think this eye contact that is actually happening within the images that are, you know, triangulating around your your eye bounces from one image to the other and back to the heron, and your eye does kind of lead back up to that eyeball and then back down to the frog. You're right. It does kind of bump, bump, bump. <laughs> yeah, so it actually creates, a, like you say, that story, that contact between well, them. I think that's we are. Initially, a lot of artists are storytellers, especially when you're drawing uh, and painting specific items. You're not an abstract painter, for instance. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you can get into lyrical aspects of your work, right? You're talking about environment and you're talking about your home life. You can talk about your kids and family and a lot of that can be integrated into your work, which I think uh, that's what people want. They want to see themselves in their in your work, and that's I think where you get the best response from is people that understand what's going on or are willing to listen. You know, that's what some of it comes down to. Absolutely, some friends of ours bought paintings, and they were of uh, walkways and cameras. And they bought them because it reminded them of the walkways. So, yeah, you've got to find the, the audience. And my stuff is a rather specific audience, I think. Uh, I'm hoping it's an educated audience that recognizes how difficult, <laughs> it, is, how difficult it is to create a uh, watercolor of this this magnitude. And Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, this one is, this one is, uh, is, is a really full one. And the foliage just spilling out into the tablecloth, um, you know, of the fruits and the, the flowers in the background. And this is a very, uh, uh, it, I, I'm absorbed in this one. I don't know how to put it. I think I'm, I, I'm looking at a lot of objects and the little greenish bird and he sort of melds into that background color in there. He's there, he's subtle, but he's not jumping off the page. And that's what I kind of like about it. If the birds were just popping off the page, everything is a, is screaming for attention, and you can't have that. And I like uh, in this kind of a painting, you need to, and you've kind of decided what's important that people need to see, and that again that conversation, how you have the background and the foreground and the midground. Actually, this one's got a midground, foreground, and a background in this one. Yeah, the, uh, the I guess the story or the concept behind this one, I I saw a. Uh, a news article about all the songbirds disappearing because people were putting glue on trees in the old country and capturing them, needing them. <laughs> that's yeah, a, li a little morbid, but that's why I went with the wooden birds with the little wiry feet because these poor creatures were just sitting there trapped on uh, on these trees and they couldn't get away. And uh, why? I never heard that. Yeah, it, it, it was bizarre. So it's kind of an homage to the uh, song, disappearance of some songbirds. And the fact that the vase doesn't have any flowers in it, uh, I allowed the background to become the flowers in this empty vase. Uh, again, making a statement about nature, I guess, and the disappearance and the man's influence on, on nature. Yeah. It all, yeah, and it's almost, uh, well, it definitely has a very fall feeling to it, an autumn um, feeling to this piece, which is kind of the the end of one life and the beginning, waiting for the beginning of the next life, right? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, that's true. That's uh, that's yeah. kind of a nice uh, concept. Uh, I like that. Not that it's supposed to be a funeral arrangement. but it's No, <laughs> no, I still like the beauty of it. Uh, We've yeah. got those birds sitting in our in our room upstairs. I love looking at them, and uh, again, that's why I put them in the painting. And, you, and, and you don't have to feed them. 
That's another nice thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the bowl's empty, so. Uh... Yeah, the bowl is empty. Yeah. No, that's. Not... This one is. Yeah, I love this one. This one is... reminds me of Monet. I wonder why. Ah, uh, might be the lilies, I would think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're all influenced by somebody in the past, right? Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, we were in Canmore and I saw this uh, swan teapot and I just fell in love with it. Uh, so when we came back, actually, I bought the uh, table runner that's, that's sitting on also in Canmore, I think, and uh, incorporated it with some photos of uh, lilies that we took on Bowen Island in near Va Vancouver. Uh, so I melded the two concepts together, the flowing of the the swan sitting on this uh, tapestry and then the tapestry that's created in nature by uh, the natural lily sitting on the water. Yeah. So, so the people that go to your shows, do they, do they understand the context of this? Do you help them to uh, understand it? Is there, or do you let, like I said, do you let them just get out of it what they like? I just let people walk around a couple like the the one that we were talking about the fragile one with the oil i ex kind of explain a couple like that that i want them to see a little bit deeper into my paintings so when you walk around i tell them just take a look at the stuff and try to understand what i'm doing here uh, yeah. and see it with your eyes you know not mine yeah. you're talking to albertans now you know i know i know <laughs> <laughs> the oil one, it's, it's a different audience, different audience. Yeah, oil is your audience. I, we can talk about that later. I got, I have the same issue. But uh, there's, uh, no, it's beautiful. I love the reflections in the bottom of the the, uh, the swan. You just that, it's very, very it's subtle, very subtle, soft, and but they lead you right up into that neck, uh, into the spout. Sorry, into the spout of it. That's what I liked about the swan. The rest is so busy that the swan had it. It helped accent the softness of that porcelain. Well, yeah. There's the want of that swan to be in that water for some reason. I don't know. And it's it's dry locked on the land. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, I I sense that. It's just okay. Why, you know? Because they all sit on the shore, right? The swans yeah. and that they'll come yeah. up on the shore and you know, they do their. Uh, yeah, that's where they hatch their kids and uh, yeah. yeah, preen themselves. So this one's preening itself. So I had it sitting there and basking. Pour, pour tea out of its hind end. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, it's a lovely piece. I love it. Thank you very much. The yeah. uh, and then you've got this fringed. It's a fringed uh, tablecloth. Is that what it is in the foreground? Yeah, it's the table runner is what it is. Table yeah. runner, okay, yeah, it's for the middle of the table. Uh, yeah. Quite long, and then I folded it and, and, and set it up. And, yeah. So yeah. yeah, this one is probably one of the stronger ones where you're really seeing nature, and the setup. This is like David Milne used to do work similar. His favorite painting spot, I think, was one of his paintings where he'd paint a still life on the hill overlooking the countryside. Mm -hmm. um, he was incorporating still life and uh, uh, nature together at the time. Okay. Uh, and yours I like because you you know you've got these found objects, um, which is our heritage. Is it's what we thought as beautiful, right? So we're yeah. This is where I kind of go with it and say man-made's beauty and nature's beauty, and they're juxtaposed a little bit in, in the same imagery, right? So there's a conversation that's it's kind of important that the viewer looks at these and it's really hard because a lot of our viewing online i mean it's on a on your phone it's seconds people are scrolling as fast as they can go through them and, and they go into a gallery and they may spend a minute in front of your piece or maybe two if you're really lucky and they move on to the next one right and uh and no, I found it in my last show like you you said that uh, people were actually really, they took like an hour to go through the entire show and then they even circled back a second time. So that, you're right, it, it, the people viewing your work is important that way because you don't get the uh, magnitude of a piece of work online. You got to slow them down. You got to slow them down somehow. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So that's uh, that's the little 
jester that's in this painting here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And she comes apart. Is that like perfume bottle? That's a perfume bottle, yeah. Okay. yeah. And uh, and that's what I've got in that painting that you had up. Well, that, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, this one is, a, you know, just playing with this high reflection. Um, yeah, so uh, put it on a piece of glass and, and uh, I love the reflections and the way the jester lady uh, reflected down into it. It just... Uh, Two-headed gesture. What's that? It's a two-headed gesture. Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, uh, gives you, you can look both ways. Yeah, I like, I like sides, that. Yeah. There's many sides to this painting, you know, the reflection and the, and the, the objects themselves being reflected in there. Right, yeah. And what's real and what isn't. Uh, I think that's what I really liked about this one. Yeah. Yeah, I find these sort of similar to people that will do a, uh, almost a mirror reflection of a lake scene and mm -hmm. the mountain and you can flip it around both ways and it doesn't matter which way you turn it it's the same right yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah. this one's not quite like that but I, I love that it's on the bias a little bit so it's not just cutting the page across the middle right you've got yeah. uh, the corner wanna... a little bit yeah. yes which which really steers your eye into the works um, you know it's a very dramatic piece and it becomes a bit uh, uh, with with the top part, the oranges and purples, almost abstract things going on in the background in that one, give yeah. it a little bit more life, a little more flair to the painting. Yeah. But uh, you know what I like about it is at least there's a segment that is dark, and then a sec. You didn't try and bring that dark down into the foreground, down into the in the very front edge of the painting. Yeah. So it really it really helps push your eye back and center because it is again there's a lot going on in this thing um and there's subtles that the glass on the left and the, the center piece which is really right up the middle right this dark piece that goes right up the middle but it's it's classic it's a classic piece it uh there's a lot of snap there's a lot of snap to it i really like it oh thank you yeah it's hard to uh make sure you don't put something directly in the middle, but it seemed to work with these sizes of the objects and the reflections. And uh, it's, a, it's a dangerous thing when you're just starting out doing artwork to put something right up the middle. But I think we break rules as we move along. Yeah. And, uh, and we learn how to break the rules. That's um, the important part of education is getting the rules and then you break them. I, I know them, yeah. Flotberg, one of our teachers had said, uh, never paint anything coming in from a corner. So for years, I painted things coming in from the corner just to prove them wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, that's excellent. I, I'm loving that. That's a it's it's a great body of work. I think you've got I think you've got a show coming up here. Yeah, in September at the uh, Peter Lougheed Center in Camrose. In Camrose, there you go. So that yeah, for two months. So. Yeah. Well, we'll do what we can to plug that for you and make sure that we can. Uh, Hopefully Thanks. get people in the area that can come through and see what's going on. Oh, we got some visitors again. There we go. We're back. We're We're back. back. Be there. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful work. Very bright and vibrant. And as David and I would say, that's why we have Paul. Because for us, it's like, ooh, pretty picture. But no, it was absolutely gorgeous. And oh. now I have to ask my standard question <laughs> that everybody gets asked, that everybody knows what I'm going to ask. So if somebody wants to buy some of your work, other than going to your website, what's your price range? If someone uh, says, I have to own a Darcy, what, what's what's going to run them? They, uh, they go from 35 to 75. Uh, okay. On the larger ones, they all have museum glass on. So the larger ones with the oversized mat and the uh, museum glass, there's over $1,100 worth of product there just to get this thing. Wow. Yeah. And the smaller ones, they're probably about six to $700 for the museum glass and the matting because I've got them double matted. Uh, so yeah, I've spent a lot of money on that. <laughs> Listen, you can tell it's, they're absolutely gorgeous. So um, thank, thank you, you for coming. And Paul only brings the best to us. So <laughs> this is, this is very I had, beautiful. I had to explode. Thank you. 
<laughs> well, if you can do that while we're on, while we're interviewing you, that would be great because that just gets us lots of viewers. So we can wait if you can get it to go relatively quick. Exploding so. heads. All right. It's floating heads. Love that. There you go. But no, it was absolutely beautiful. Oh, thank you. It's wonderful. A friend, actually, I'll, I'll share a friend of mine just bought six sheets of mat board for doing a project, $245 for six yep. sheets of mat board. Yeah. It has gone up exponentially Man. unbelievable in the cost of presentation so it's a really it's a real hurt on artists to have to present their work because a lot of, especially in the gallery situation you don't get that money back you, I buy, know. It, you they, buy at full retail they want the, gallery, the gallery puts it in and gets 50 percent of that so you're yeah. in the hole already 50 percent as That's soon as you right. frame your work and you put it into the gallery so you have to sell it you got to double the price just to break even yeah, absolutely. That's why I try to set up my own shows right now because uh, yeah. a lot of galleries have gone out of business and I was in one gallery that closed and I lost two paintings because the guy never paid me and disappeared with them. Yep, it happens a lot. Antique dealer, he said, you can take any of my antiques in the store and I'll take four of your paintings. I said, okay. Next day, I showed up at the store, and he had done a midnight run, and the store was gone and everything. My four paintings he took. Yeah. So I'm a little cautious when I, <laughs> when I go to galleries and different uh, people that are trying to, you know, they're trying to make a living, too. But uh, yeah. well, well, the good thing is we don't need anything. We're good. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. No, I think every artist has had those experiences, and uh, it's called experience. Yes. And nobody wants it. That's why I've got the gray hair. Yeah, gray yeah. hair. <laughs> Feel your pain. Yeah. So. Great. <laughs> well, David's cool. jet. By the way, David's jet black hair. He dyes his gray, so he looks older. <laughs> He's really twenty nine, and uh, it's just this is how it goes. Yeah. So. He, uses a, he uses his glasses. He uses a <laughs> yes. surface mirror as well. He just uses a yes. surface mirror, right? So you can be skinny, or you can be. Yep. So, yeah, we don't know what David really looks like. It's all done with the AI now. So, for all we know, he could be a 27-year-old Filipino lady. We're not sure. Oh, wow. <laughs> You've caught me out at last. So, uh, yeah, what can I say? So, well, Darcy, thank you. Thank you so much. It was yeah. absolutely wonderful. We'll have Darcy's information below with his site and whatnot. Um, so you can go and you can see his stuff or purchase or go see one of his shows. Thanks very much, gentlemen. Thank you. We'll, uh, yeah, we'll cross promo you uh, as well, Darcy. So we'll get you. All right. Take care. Thank you, man. Thanks for Thank the day. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Paul. Bye.